I'm so happy to present uh, General Ben Hodges, a free star general, uh, retired, but uh, only to a certain extent, I would say. Uh, general Ben Hodges, you are uh, still a very active man, aren't you? You are uh, consulting NATO logistics, and uh, also you have great concerns about human rights, but basically you happen to be lecturing and, and giving good advice uh, uh, everywhere in Europe. You are, you are traveling rapidly. We, I was able to shake your hand uh, last week at the conference, uh, security conference in Tartu, Estonia. So what are you doing right now and uh, how uh, can you project even more sense of security into the Baltic states? Please. So, uh, well, first let me say thanks for this privilege um, to, to speak to your audience. Uh, and I and I enjoyed uh, seeing you uh, and being at the Baltic Defense College uh, Russia conference in Tartu last week. Um, since I retired six years ago, I have spent uh, probably about ninety percent of my professional time focused on uh, Ukraine, uh, NATO's eastern flank, uh, and making sure that U.S. and the U.S. does not turn its back on Europe and and vice versa. And I do that in a variety of ways, whether it's as NATO senior mentor for logistics or in consulting um, or, and as you saw when I went to the uh, Baltic Defense College Russia, annual Russia conference in Tartu, um, I say yes to every opportunity to help explain uh, what I think the threat is and what we need to be doing to address the threat and to prevent that threat from turning into actual aggression against our allies. How has our life in, in the sense of, of uh, security changed after uh, Swedish Kingdom and uh, Finnish Republic have been accepted to NATO? Well, NATO got better the very minute each of those countries joined the alliance because they bring uh, capable military, uh, strong liberal democratic uh, societies, uh, both countries have very good defense industry and of course the geography of the alliance um, is much more in our advantage now from a defensive standpoint because of the long border that finland has with russia and and also uh, what sweden offers along with finland to protection of the baltic sea and the high north so uh, this Putin's attack on Ukraine, which caused Finland and Sweden to decide they needed to be in NATO, I think will be studied for years as one of the biggest strategic errors ever made by any head of state. Um, while you were, were presenting uh, to the uh, to the conference at Tartu, you also named the names of, of uh, bigger and smaller cities in the Baltic, like Vilnius, uh, Tartu, Kleipe, the Riga, Tallinn, you were uh, actually saying that uh, we should be prepared that uh, very many or multiple uh, precious objects would be, uh, would be uh, demolished during the first days of, of the would-be attack, which hopefully would never happen. What did you actually mean, sir? The Russians clearly are going to use multi-million dollar precision weapons against civilian targets. I mean, we, sh we should not fool ourselves that Riga, Tallinn, Vilnius, Klaipeda, Tartu, anywhere there's anything of value is going to be hit. So um, if, as we've observed for the last two years, uh, Russia uh, is willing to use multi-million dollar precision weapons against civilian infrastructure. Uh, they, they're doing it against Ukraine. Uh, every day. And so we should not kid ourselves that somehow our cities, our infrastructure would not be targeted by the Russians. If, if they've made the terrible decision, a miscalculation, but if they've made the terrible decision to attack a NATO country, then for sure they would have already made the terrible decision to attack all of our infrastructure because they know that the alliance depends on the ability to rapidly reinforce, to bring up troops, air, land, and sea uh, capabilities into the region. So we should assume uh, that uh, 
every bit of infrastructure that's required for that would be hit. Uh, power generation, transportation, uh, cyber, all the uh, facilities that are needed for command and control. Um, and, and therefore, that means tens of thousands of civilians would be exposed to these kinds of attacks. Uh, obviously, that's a horrible thing to even have to contemplate, uh, but we'd be foolish not to think about it and therefore to do what we can to protect uh, those those uh, our cities. So the air and missile defense capability needed um, right now, we are nowhere near where it needs to be. Um, I mean, the U.S. only has one Patriot battalion in all of Europe. And they don't require most of that battalion just to protect Ramstein, so air base uh, in Germany. So I think, I, you know, the answer can't be everybody buys more Patriot or NASAMs or whatever, um, but it does need to be something that the Alliance works on. Uh, I, as you heard me, I encouraged uh, the chiefs of defense from each of the Baltic countries to demand that NATO does a large-scale comprehensive air and missile defense exercise in the worst possible conditions so that we can find out where those gaps are. If we don't do that, then I think we are uh, uh, whistling past the, the cemetery. Furthermore, you even say that uh, we might face some uh, unpleasant uh, surprises while testing our air, air uh, defense capabilities. I guarantee it. Um, it it's always the case. Um, that's why you have to exercise because, you know, you go out there and you realize, oh my gosh, we don't have enough of this, or it took too long to do this, or we, I can't communicate in this kind of uh, conditions. So you have to, you have to exercise and we call it exercising to the point of failure, just like an elite athlete exercises up until they achieve muscle failure so that they can keep getting better. And that's what we have to do both in our military uh, institutions, but also our civilian institutions. Uh, the the resilience needed in a society, governments have to practice that. And it's it's no fun. Uh, it's disruptive. Some, some politicians are reluctant to do it because they think it will alarm people. But uh, as my Finnish friend told me, that Finns are never scared because they're always prepared. They have thought through and actually practiced what they might have to do in a, uh, in a crisis. I think that's good policy. General, given that we now have uh, Finland and Sweden uh, as members of NATO uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, keeping in mind that you're a, a uh, sophisticated specialist of, of uh, NATO logistics, how uh, long it would now, under the circumstances, take uh, for reinforcement to arrive if some of the Baltic states will be, which won't happen, I'm sure, but will be uh, theoretically attacked. Uh, the nations have done everything necessary to facilitate rapid movement. Then this could happen in just a few days. Uh, what you saw recently that the Netherlands, Germany and Poland completed an agreement to create a mobility corridor that would uh, enable rapid movement of Euro uh, NATO forces across northern Europe up into the Baltic region. That these are important things that have to be done to ensure that the infrastructure is fit for uh, large numbers of heavy uh, vehicles, uh, but also that the borders can be quickly crossed uh, between allied countries, between EU countries. Even. That was a citation uh, from you, uh, General. Uh, how long would it practically take for, let's say, a brigade, a tank brigade, uh, to to be moved from Slovenia to anywhere like Denmark. Have, have some of those uh, obstacles been uh, resolved right now? Yeah, I would say we're in a better place than we were a few years ago, but it's not adequate because we have to keep in mind that if we're trying to prevent a crisis from happening, all of these movements are going to be happening during peacetime conditions. So that means all the normal road rules remain in effect. Uh, we don't have special access to the various rail. We're competing with civilian commercial traffic. And so um, working through those kinds of challenges told me that you needed more capacity for rail. You needed more rapid access. 
to rail. Uh, you needed more of the heavy trucks that can carry a tank down the highway. Uh, of course, all of this is expensive. And so you end up trying to push as much forward to be uh, based forward as is feasible, but you can't just park divisions inside Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania because there's nowhere for them to train. It's, it's not practical. So finding that balance. Um, I tried back in 2017, so my last full year that I was the commander of U.S. Army Europe, to, to do the calculation um, to assemble the armored brigade up in uh, Suwaki, northeast Poland. Um, how long would it take? given in peacetime conditions with what we had. And I put the goal of six days. I said, I want the brigade to be there in six days. And it was mathematically impossible so, uh, to do it. How, how, how many days would it, be, would it have been instead? Yeah, it would have been a couple of weeks. Five years ago, it called the Future War and the Defense of Europe. You were remarkably, um, uh, uh, I would say, uh, critical uh, uh, towards the... Uh, the um, uh, strengths and capacities of European defense, uh, particularly one sentence reads like, um, whilst the individual European citizen might in time have access to more resilient locally provided pandemic protection, the state itself will become progressively more vulnerable to externally generated strategic shock. And uh, I have observed also that the the narrative, the the very rational and encouraging, uh, and and partly even um, well, I would say uh, quite uh, forcible narrative of of uh, Europe having to be able to defend uh, uh, itself. It somewhat contradicts to a certain very powerful and weird narrative which we we hear. And uh, I will now ask you to, to uh, watch a very uh, short fraction from a video from uh, your previous uh, 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 chief of, uh, what, uh, what is a president, a, 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 a higher, higher chief commander of uh, armed forces of America, is, is a president take, uh, having this position. Okay, Donald, Donald Trump, <laughs> let's, let's watch yeah. this video. Russia right now, I'm not saying anything out of school. I read it in one of our newspapers, so, you know, it's probably fake news, but maybe not. I don't think it is. Russia right now is making massive amounts of ammunition. Sounds simple, right? But they're making massive beyond anything they've ever made before. We don't have any ammunition. We've given it to Ukraine. We're not we're not prepared to fight. I rebuilt our military, new planes, new tanks, new everything. They've taken the, the military that I've rebuilt and they've given it all to Ukraine. I mean, massive amounts. Given it all to Ukraine, is this uh, close to what we call the truth? I, I didn't realize you could cram so many lies into such a short amount of, uh, of time. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously, you know, the claims that he rebuilt the military is, is outlandish uh, and that it's all been given to Ukraine is also... Um, Tanks, uh, ammunition, all to Ukraine. It's, but, um, but, sir, who would be the target audience of this type of messages? Outright lies, I would also say. Well, of course, what he is constantly doing is to undermine people's confidence in the current administration and to build up himself as... He tried to do everything he could, but it was thrown away. So this is part of a terrible false narrative by the Trump uh, campaign um, that unfortunately too many people uh, believe. Now, I wish that we had provided a lot more to Ukraine. This has been, this has been uh, despite all the good that the Biden administration has done, they have failed to do the most important thing, which is to clearly define the strategic objective. What do we want the outcome to be? And of course it should be that Ukraine defeats Russia. And if that was the case, then we would prioritize delivering to Ukraine those things which are needed. We haven't done that. Did you observe the same when you were uh, the, um, the chief commander of American uh, armed forces in Europe that uh, 
you tried to press your message. You were putting this in writing. You had nice speeches, some of which I have been, uh, um, uh, I have been uh, watching. It didn't have much effect. At the same time, you were uh, you were stationed in Germany, weren't you? And yes. and and the ministers of defense, part, uh, particularly also the round uh, the the renowned Ursula von der Leyen, they were just at the same time decreasing the military capabilities of Germany. Particularly, I remember one case, the the strange case, the the funny case of, of the broomsticks at some NATO training operation. A German, um, some Germ German army armored carriers seem to have uh, broomsticks instead of of guns, and then. But uh, but more seriously, I guess there were a handful of uh, German strategic, uh, what they call the U-boats, the submarines, and it at, at the, and it appeared that simultaneously all of them were were being docked for reparation simultaneously. So you saw this. Uh, this um, vast and dangerous contrast of, of words and deeds. So, talk is cheap. What would you say? Well, um, the it, it's very difficult uh, to get our political leaders to recognize uh, a threat sometimes, because when you acknowledge a threat, then you are now bound, you have to do something about it. And that usually means investing uh, more money into your defenses, infrastructure. Uh, and if the, if the threat is not immediately apparent, then it's, it's harder to convince the population to say, hey, look, you know, I, and by the way, I live here in beautiful uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, it's, it's a great place. I'm looking out across the street now at the university. And, uh, you know, until two years ago, if, you would have, if I would have asked any of my neighbors, hey, what do you think the biggest threat is? Russia would not have been in the top five. They would have talked about climate change, uh, Trump, uh, terrorism, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, now, most Germans recognize uh, that uh, Russia is not this responsible global power that you can deal with through economic means and you can reasonably negotiate with them. And so most Germans are waking up to that. And so you can see that there's a, a renewed emphasis on rebuilding uh, German military capability, German defense industry, and um, acknowledging that East, our Eastern European allies were right all along. So that at least it's moving in the right direction, but it, it is, it, it's taken a long time. And the German Bundeswehr, uh, which is loaded with a lot of quality people, um has got to regain the culture of readiness you know what in the german language they would call it uh kriegs tutish kite ready prepared for war or einsatzbereitschaft which is ready to conduct operations absolutely um, <laughs> but, but do, do you so, see this actually happening then yes i do actually um uh, I'm very impressed that Germany is going to uh, build a brigade that it will put in Lithuania, um, replacing the EFP battle group with a full brigade by 2027. Uh, this brigade will be the best, biggest brigade in the German army. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're getting serious again about this culture of readiness. And, and, of course, this is not just the Germans. I mean, even some of our Baltic allies we're not at the level of readiness. You can't. You cannot stand at the border with a big sign that says, "Hey, we're two percent," and expect <laughs> that to do anything. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, you you have to uh, you have to get out and train you, all of your reservists, the uh, militia. They have to practice. They have to know where to go. And uh, I think now, of course, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, are much more serious about this than they were maybe. A few years ago, was it a big surprise to you, General, that uh, North Korea was able to outsupply the West in pro providing ammunition to their friend Russia? Yeah, I'm. I'm actually uh, surprised at the uh, not at the quantity, but that they've managed to to deliver all this, and and we haven't found a way to stop it. 
I mean, uh, there's there's some sanctions violations that are obviously uh, going on. Um, combination of rail and ships uh, getting it up to Russia, and then Russia's able to move it across. There was one time where the uh, Ukrainians were able to destroy a rail tunnel uh, that the North Koreans were using initially. The fact that they're still able to deliver the volume of ammunition that they're delivering, you know, we've, there's got to be a way to stop this. Uh, same with the drones come from Iran or uh, components coming from China. Um, so part, part of helping Ukraine defeat Russia means continuing to isolate Russia from external support. Um, it's pretty good now, but it's obviously not good enough. But um, I think um, you would admit that the intelligence everybody in the world uh, seems to be relying on, it's, uh, it's not, the f- not the intelligence we were thinking it to be, actually. Um, if you observe, you were part of... Uh, of U.S. campaign in Afghanistan, also in Iraq, and you remember when uh, when the U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force was leaving uh, Bagram uh, Airport, the old airport, uh, I I think is established by the Soviets. Yet, so the assumption was that the Kabul government uh, government is is going to be there for another two years, but it appeared it was something like two months rather. So, what were your your uh, big surprises uh, after the twenty fourth of February, two thousand twenty two? I mean, did you, for instance, assume that uh, President C would come to help uh, his uh, friend for lifetime, President Putin, uh, by delivering uh, hardware, uh, cannons, tanks like that, shells? Or uh, was it a surprise to you, I'm just uh, offering, might or might, might it not have been, that Belarus army actually uh, did was not actually involved in Ukraine? What, what kind of uh, surprises did you have as compared to the intelligence you, you thought you had before? Yeah. Well, the, the biggest, most obvious is that uh, I had grossly overestimated Russian capabilities in the beginning. Uh, um, I think we, I, I never believed the three day scenario. I mean, this, I mean, physically I had just been in Kiev just two weeks before that, before the 24th of February. And so I'm thinking there's no way that you could even get to Kiev, let alone capture it in three days. I, I know a little bit about these kinds of things. So I never believed that, but I did not, anticipate that Russia would be so poorly prepared to conduct a modern joint operation uh, integrating air, land, and sea power. So that that was was uh, one thing. I did not anticipate how poorly prepared they were logistically to conduct a large-scale land operation. Uh, and, and I've tried to figure out why, why were they so poorly prepared? I'm, I'm sorry to be interrupting, but um, in 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 Estonia, as far as I can realize, based on my contacts so with our military here, the assumption also uh, also has been that uh, Russians are so good in electronic warfare, so they would be absolutely sure to take down every communication of their adversary. But it didn't happen. Yeah, you're you're right. The Russians have. The Soviets and now the Russians have always had better electronic warfare capabilities than we did. And certainly we had anticipated that they would, uh, uh, using their various uh, jamming capabilities as well as cyber, would shut down everything. But, you know, as, we, as we've looked at trying to figure out how did we get it so wrong, uh, one of the things, of course, was the massive corruption, the impact of corruption at every level and every facet of Russian military capabilities. That that had a, has a corrosive effect, uh, number one. Number two, I think that the Russians were, um, this, this was not an attack that was planned in the traditional sense by the general staff. This was an FSB sort of operation. And so they assumed that they would be able to roll in and take over everything. And so... They, they needed they needed the uh, Ukrainian uh, communications infrastructure to be in place. That's, you know, a lot of Russian generals were killed in the early days because they were talking on cell phones on uh, Ukrainian 
cell networks, um, which is e very easy to be targeted when you're doing that. So I think um, their failure was partly not that they didn't know how, but that they chose not to because they had of the concept for how they were going to take over. I'm, I'm going to have a, a tactical question. I'm not <laughs> very far from being being a specialist of any kind here, but um, I, I was listening to a stream by a um, a Ukraine colonel, Polkovnik, as they call them. So uh, he said that maybe it would have made sense to let uh, the Russian uh, land forces even uh, somewhat enter uh, Kiev suburbs like Oboland to be there destroyed en masse. Would you agree? No. Uh, I mean, I, I see what he's saying. Uh, and certainly the Russians would have suffered enormous casualties if they had entered into this very complex urban terrain, as we call it. Uh, but that means an awful lot of civilians would have been killed, too, and a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, destruction of civilian property. So I don't know that... I mean. I can see what he's saying, but I, I would not have advocated this. Why did uh, Putin still remain loyal to his uh, FSB head Bortnikov or or uh, General Gerasimov, the the chief of, of staff and and uh, Minister Shaigu, or the uh, the the leader of of several intelligence organizations, Patrushev? Why are those guys still there after this humiliating failure? Yeah, that, what a great question. Um, I have been surprised that uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov have kept their posts, but uh, it seems that they're still in the job because of their intense loyalty uh, to, uh, uh, to Putin himself. And I suspect he has a very small circle of people around him that he really, truly trusts. Uh, and he may not have somebody else that he can turn to, uh, that he would trust uh, at, at the same level. Um, now, maybe, you know, they made the case that, hey, look, you know, you let FSB plan this. If it, if it would have been us, it would have gone much better. So now he's, what you're seeing, of course, is a Russian, uh, a more traditional Russian general staff uh, operation in terms of planning uh, and, and a continued traditional willingness to expend bodies uh, in the meat grinder in this war of attrition. Um, but I, I think it really boils down to loyalty uh, and not, not, not being confident in who might have to replace. Uh, but just, uh, just to be sure, um, what, what was the practice regarding uh, those uh, American generals who failed in, in some operations, failed to deliver in Iraq or Afghanistan? Were, were those being changed quickly? Yeah, sure. We we had several general officers who were uh, replaced early uh, by the president or by the head of the army uh, when we failed uh, to do uh, what we were supposed to do, and and correctly so. I mean, at the end of the day, civilian control of the military includes um, if you lose confidence in a commander, then then they have to go. You'll remember uh, uh, General McChrystal was probably the most famous, uh, but. Two or three people before him were also replaced uh, earlier than than would have been anticipated. So, in hindsight, you would say those changes were to the better. They were appropriate. All right. So we were talking about logistics. Um, I have been wondering. You know, uh, it would be uh, very hard for us uh, both, probably, to assume that that. Um, that um, Chancellor Olaf Scholz or, or President Biden will will are, are somewhat, uh, I mean, hesitant or even cowardly. Might there be that there uh, have been some uh, secret agreements about some secret red lines drawn? Uh, particularly, it has been uh, occurring to my mind that uh, as we were talking about the uh, the logistic routes of the uh, Korean arms uh, being taken to, to Russia. Um, I have not been uh, seeing information about any NATO echelon on Ukraine soil. They are coming normally by rail from Poland via Lviv and then towards the east, that they have been attacked. Although they should be observable through the satellite system by the Russians and whatnot, but it just hasn't happened. 
uh, simultaneously we see that there have been no uh, real uh, bombardments, uh, rocket bombardments of the uh, Kerch breach, the Crimean breach. So might there be some agreements which are not being vocally voiced, but which are there, red lines? Um, I, I can see how some people might think that. Uh, I certainly am not aware of, of anything like that. I think the Kerch Bridge has actually been hit probably 20 different times, different types of, of attacks, not just the one time where they had uh, real success. Um, I think that they are continuously probing for ways to figure out how will they eventually drop that bridge, which will be a real chore. I mean, it's not like two or three uh, Taurus and, and it's gone. That, that, that is a very large structure. But but that how much Taurus is instead or, or, well, or attack a message? I'm not confirmed. I'm not uh, convinced that Taurus or Atacums are the the weapon of, that will do it. It, it probably will be a, a combination of things happening over a period of time uh, when the Ukrainians are ready to do it. Uh, now, the the supply lines from Poland into Ukraine, I, I've been very surprised that the Russians have been unable to interdict these what we call lines of communication, the supply lines. Uh, they come on rail, they come on highway, and not one convoy has been destroyed. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's ninety percent rail. So I, I I share your surprise, but what what do you still yeah, think? This, how, how, how's that? Uh, how, how's that? The the air force is not very good. Um, you know, having a lot of airplanes, even modern airplanes, does not give you a great air force. Uh, the Russians failed the most important task for any air force, which is to achieve air superiority. Um, and if you want to be able to hit convoys and trains that are, so we're talking about moving targets, you've got to have something that's up all the time, that's watching, and then is able to, do, to direct strike aircraft to go hit the moving target. And so these big, uh, the A-5 zeros that have been lost on the Russian side, that's the kind of airplane that has to be able to be up to see. And then you have to have strike aircraft that are close by that can go over there. You cannot do that if you can't even fly in Ukrainian airspace. So the failure to achieve air superiority has dramatically reduced their ability to hit convoys and trains. So this is this is not a red line. This is flat out failure by the Russian Air Force. Um, now, the the fact that there's no uh, attacks inside of Russia other than what Ukraine is doing with their own drones. I think this this was a political decision. Uh, it's the reason that the U.S. and Germany, I think, have uh, in part not provided the the 300 kilometer Atakums or Taurus is because they believe that Ukraine would use those weapons inside Russia. Ukraine has said they won't do it. They don't use British or French cruise missiles inside Russia. But uh, I, I think this is a mistake by the U.S. and Germany. Somebody told me, not more, somebody more knowledgeable than me, <laughs> I, I, I must admit that F-16 aircraft, uh, it, it's good. Ukraine needs them. Hopefully they are, they are, they are there. Uh, they are activated in, in, in the summer. But uh, what about the old F-18 aircraft? Australia seemed to have them in excess. They are, they are not so so new anymore but uh, they reportedly are are able to 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 land even on on an aircraft carrier so they are less demanding they also have two motors as ex as as opposed to the one motor f-16 why why would uh, why would uh, nato not not give ukraine f-18s instead of 16s I think that it's important to keep in mind that there is no one airplane or one platform or one weapon that changes everything. Now, there is no magical thing about a particular aircraft. Now, what you really want is capability, capability to uh, deter enemy aircraft, to, to knock down missiles coming in, to support ground operations, to make Crimea untenable, um, and of course, or F-16s or F-18s or 
any uh, griffins from Sweden. Yep. Um, it's not just the plane. It's the whole array of radar targeting systems, and they're working together as part of the system, not just one airplane flying around out there destroying everything like in a movie. And so um, that's, that's what takes a long time for the training. It's not to help the pilot take off and land, but operating within a system uh, that would be going against or going into a very heavily contested air environment, lots of it, Russian air defense, uh, jamming, all these things. That's what takes a while. Now, of course, we should have we should have been pushing this two years ago, not now, but we are where we are. Um, I think we'll see um, different aircraft uh, beginning to appear in the summertime, as you say, and uh, and it will make a difference. But I don't see the quantity to completely change the the environment. So the Ukrainians will be smart on protecting these aircraft and putting them in where they think they can get the best effect. Okay. <clears throat> Talking about air missiles now, um, it, it, it has been clear that uh, that uh, neither United Kingdom nor, nor US is, is giving their, their, um, their rockets with the utmost uh, shooting distance, like attack MS says, Several versions, and so so have uh, so so does Storm Shadow. Don't you think the same is going to the same limitation is going to be applied when uh, uh, the discussions uh, go as far to which kind of uh, missiles to to award Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania from from Estonian border? It's one hour drive to Petersburg, so. Would you think we'll be we will be in a position of getting those uh, max range attack MSs for our HIMARSes, for instance? Yeah, well, I certainly hope so. Um, I, you know, I, you're asking a question I could not possibly answer, but it never would have occurred to me that we would uh, limit the range of weapons that we might provide to an ally. Because I mean, keep in mind, Estonian forces. If it's a NATO operation, Estonian forces would not only fight in Estonia. They could be down in Poland or somewhere else, depending on what the the plan was, the situation was. So that doesn't that doesn't um, sound like something that we would do. I certainly hope not. Um, the the ATACMs that we want to that I think we should be providing to Ukraine, of course, are the three hundred kilometer range. Uh, what we call a unitary round, not the cluster munition, but the large high explosive round that can reach out to 300 kilometers. That matters because every bit of Russian occupied Ukraine is within 300 kilometers of Kherson or Kramatorsk. So if you had the HIMARS launchers up there launching ATACMs, every single Russian headquarters, logistics site, artillery battery would be unsafe. And I mean, that would make such a difference. Uh, the entire Crimean Peninsula, unsafe. It would be impossible for the Russians to stay there because they would be getting pounded. And, and that's why I, it's so frustrating. I don't understand why the Biden administration is unwilling to provide those. You have somewhat been uh, been uh, privy or being close to uh, US politicians. You, according to what I see, you I uh, held the position of Congressional Liaison Officer of General Staff uh, at the beginning of the century. What is this about? Do you know more about uh, congressmen, their, uh, their uh, political games, their uh, nature? Uh, well, thanks for bringing that up. I did serve um, as the Chief of Army Congressional Liaison. Uh, each of our services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and in fact also the other departments of the government, have liaison offices that help answer questions of the relevant congressional oversight committees. So House and Senate Armed Services Committee, for example, that's who draws up the authorization bills that direct what the military does. So my job would have been helping explain Army requirements to those committee members uh, from House and Senate Armed Services Committee, as well as 
um, helping explain when individual members of Congress had a question about something that the Army was doing or a base that was in their state, for example. Um, that was a fascinating experience for me because it required me, I had to relearn all the civics that I had had as a kid in high school and university. I had to relearn you know, how the government functions and how the Congress operates. And it helped me as I became a more senior officer to understand that when a congressman would ask a question or they came out to visit, I understood the process much better and how to answer their question. And this is important because, you know, the, the president doesn't give money. The Congress is who gives the money without congressional support. There is no, there is no budget. And so uh, being able to articulate the requirement and explain it to them was an important part of us getting the financial support. Oh, you are, as well as the, you are taking us the exactly to the question I wanted to ask. This was a preparation to this one. Uh, I have been, we, everybody, everybody on, on, uh, on the stone and soil probably, and, and also in Frankfurt has been, uh, has been um, uh, feeling this uh, heartbreak feeling while uh, Ukraine army has, uh, has surrendered Avdiivka to the Russians and furthermore, Robotnia is, is under fire, uh, and um, they're just uh, they're just communicating. They they don't have enough shells. At the same time, uh, we all observed that in May uh, 2022, uh, the U.S. Congress almost unanimously uh, accepted the what they call the Public Law Number 117 uh, 100, uh, 118 about land lease to Ukraine. And uh, and part of the law instructs the president to within sixty days to define the volume and and the uh, particularities of the arms shipment, which evidently President Biden didn't do within sixty days. Then this law expired within eighteen months without Ukraine, the key of government, even officially applying to lend lease. Uh, and some of them were communicating very strangely enough that it would have been expensive. Now, not being a specialist of, of anything, I'm a universal journalist. Uh, I was looking into the Congressional Budget Office uh, documents, and uh, according to those, the first payment would have been made in the year 2071. Who, who would, who that would care? I mean. <laughs> Yeah. Preserving the Republic as opposed to a payment in, in distant future with the probable help of the European Union and inflation. What happened, sir? Yeah, of course, I, I don't fully understand all of that myself. And, and, and Hans, you're, you're ahead of me. You've done some really good research to Thanks. be able to plot those facts there. Um, I, I think the, the bottom line is that um, the, the president and his administration uh, who have done a good job on so many aspects of helping Ukraine have not been able or have not come to the conclusion that it's in our interest that Ukraine defeats Russia, that Russia is beaten, kicked back to the 1991 borders. If they did, if they said this is our priority, then they would do all those things that are necessary with the right level of urgency. Uh, instead, I think they're hoping that Russia kind of you know, that it comes to a halt at some point. And, and we have too many people in our government uh, in Washington uh, that somehow believe that Russia is too big to fail, that it's not to our advantage that Russia is defeated, that we can't have a regime collapse. They're worried about what might happen. And there are, unfortunately, you know, we joke about in Germany, Kremlin first airs or Putin first airs, and we, we have them in, uh, in Washington also. Uh, on both sides, and it it is defies understanding that uh, I mean, if you go back a few years when Russia invaded Georgia two thousand and eight, that was during the Bush administration. We did zero, zero. Uh, and then uh, Russia invades uh, Ukraine in two thousand and fourteen. We did nothing. Then so the administrations, Republican and Democrats, have not understood Russia the way Eastern Europeans do. And, and so we have failed to see that it's our advantage that we could change European security for decades if we help Ukraine defeat Russia. And so because of that, 
have allowed the Republicans, the, the MAGA Trump wing controlled Republican Party, with a few people to stop aid to Ukraine because the president has not made the case. That's where we are. Yes, but but we're not uh, Vice Secretary Newland and also, by the by, Vice President Biden, uh, 10 years ago, 2014, communicating uh, you, the Ukraine government that you shouldn't shoot, you shouldn't start armed conflict because of Crimea. It will be resolved future, uh, in the future. Uh, how how do you look at that uh, in hindsight? I would I would even ask you uh, if I uh, if if I was uh, imagining I was a commander of a army submarine and and on the Kai some uh, so called uh, uh, what were they <laughs> visually were ludi so polite people uh, Russians actually were ordering me to surrender. Why wouldn't I shoot? Uh, I shut all the openings, just dive and and. And uh, and swing to Turkey, for instance. What what happened? Why was the U.S. communicating this uh, the the activities which you call defend? What what what, what did you call it? Uh, well, if if you're surrendering, not surrenderism, but uh, okay, I, I, defeatist. I, defeatist. Yes. Why were they defeatist? Yeah, uh, of course, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, this, these questions are all fair questions that I cannot answer because um, it reflects a failure on our part for decades, ever since post Reagan, that somehow uh, we could deal with Russia or that Russia was a, you remember President Obama said Russia is a regional power. Okay. Uh, so this is not Republican or Democrat. It's at both sides. Bush said he looked into Putin's eyes and could see his soul. And, um, you know, we, we have failed uh, administration after administration after administration to really decide uh, that we need to defeat Russia, that if we don't defeat Russia, if we don't bring about a regime collapse, then Putin will be replaced when he dies by another Putin like character. And I think it goes to a, a fear of Russia using a nuclear weapon. And the Russians can see this. They talk about nuclear weapons all the time and because they see that we hesitate. We deter ourselves like, oh my God, they might use a nuclear weapon. When, the, when Russia says, we're moving a nuclear weapon to Belarus, people start wetting themselves like, oh my God, they might, they're moving a nuclear weapon to Belarus, which does zero to improve the quality of the nuke or the likelihood that they would use it. But the fact they move it to Belarus makes everybody start getting excited again. And the Russians, they must laugh uh, when they do this, but that's that's what causes us, I think, to, uh, to stop short of being decisive. How long will it take uh, if things get serious to, for uh, Bundeswehr or, or Poland or Denmark to obtain nuclear capacities um that will take some time but i'm glad you brought this up I, I think it is time that germany and poland and some other countries um, start having this uh discussion a conversation uh in their countries with their population about <clears throat> you know especially if they don't trust the united states or if they're worried about a return of trump um and the French have not indicated that they would extend their nuclear shield to protect others. The UK's is, is fairly limited. So um, I think it's reasonable for governments to have that conversation. Uh, now, of course, it's be very expensive. It's more than just having a, a nuclear weapon. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, but I, I think, and of course, there are multiple, multiple treaties out there that would have to be uh, rewritten or, or abrogated so that that i mean that there's a huge political and informational aspect to this as well of course the russians will go crazy on it but do, would you advise them better to be pre prepared looking forward to the presidential elections in the states well two things first um, i hope that our european allies are working very hard with not only the current u.s administration but a potential Trump administration to explain why it's an American's advantage 
that it does not turn its back. I mean, from a purely selfish standpoint, it's America's advantage that we are present in Europe. Our prosperity depends on European prosperity. So hopefully they'll be doing that so we never get to this to this case. You were on the stage at Tartu, Tartu Russia conference while, uh, uh, while someone uh, also participated in this panel was saying that uh, if uh, Donald Trump, uh, as, as future president, for instance, would insist on, on uh, limiting uh, US presence in uh, military presence in Europe, Europe could push back saying that, see, Donald, you will have to face China soon in multiple ways and we will will we might or might not find time to to listen to your proposals does it make no, uh, business this is it's our advantage it's good for america that we have allies because we do not have enough capability and capacity to do everything and so uh, all of our best allies come from europe as well as canada and australia so um, it would be foolish for us to turn our back on our European allies. Ben Hodges, it was such a, a pleasure to have you, uh, and please keep up your good work, sir. And you too. Um, you know, part of what separates the, us from the Russians is a uh, strong, fair, aggressive media that, that makes us look at ourselves and, and, and helps us think about what's out there. So what you're doing is just as important as any military thing that's going on. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.